Welcome to this week's edition of Indigo Living. Well, I want to say on the couch series, but with 2020 and a little social distancing, we've upgraded our set to a fancy new table. But we still have incredible guests that join us each week. Whether they're small business owners, big business owners, philanthropists, women in the community that are making a difference, they have joined us each week to share their story. And I truly hope they inspire you as they inspire me. Now, as it's the end of 2020, I'd like to say one of the most memorable years ever, this month, the producers and I have decided to celebrate authors, women that have created and achieved something so special and have documented into a book. So today, we're welcoming Neha. She has created and designed the most incredible, inspiring book of the year. It's called Girl Power, and it celebrates 50 incredible women from India. Please welcome Neha. Welcome Neha, I'm so happy you're here. Uh, it's such a pleasure. So it is December and you know, when we were talking with the producers, we really wanted this month to be special. It is the end of 2020. Finally. Finally, yes. I, I don't think I've ever emphasized that word so much. Yes, it is the end of 2020 and we wanted to celebrate female entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and women that have created books, whether they're coffee table books or inspirational books like yours. Uh, we wanted to celebrate them and hopefully if you guys are doing any Christmas shopping you're going to click to the basket and this will go into your uh, wish list because these books are truly inspirational. Thank you. But I want to start out with your journey because I love sharing people's stories of how they got to where they've got and um, you have such an incredible story because I feel like you've always given back. Charity and uh, philanthropy has always been instilled in your family values um, and even in your career. It has, you know, and for me, it's been, um, well, let me start with a story. Let me start with a story and take you back. Um, I was actually working for the UN for a long time and I was working for, with UNICEF. And what we were trying to do was provide access to quality education for India's children, right? A, a lofty goal, and it was. Um, it was a wonderful time. I learned a lot, but I think there comes a time and this happens to so many people who are working in these large multilateral agencies where you feel like you're working with policies and paper, but you're not really working with people. Um, and I decided that I, I, wanted to, I wanted to focus on that. And it so happened that around the time that I was doing this, I was living and working in Delhi. And Delhi was building um, the Delhi Metro. And they had gotten in migrant labor from all over the country good folk who were, who were engaged in building this, um, uh, this big infrastructure project. But these folks had nowhere to put their children in school. So what I decided to do was go to my alma mater. Uh, they weren't using the classrooms in the evening, so I said, give them over to me and I'll teach these children. And um, it began, and, and what began as sort of a small project really became one of the formative experiences of my life. Uh, be because I felt like my day job complemented my night job, so to speak. What I was doing in policy then began to have its impact on the people I was working with and vice versa. And um, right around then, I remember I came across this line by, uh, by Desmond Tutu and he said something to the tune of, you know, there comes a point in our lives when we have to stop pe pulling people out of the river and we have to look upstream to find out why they were falling in the river in the first place. I love that. It was fantastic and I thought about it. And it was that work downstream, which is pulling people out of the river, which is your, your, your volunteer work or your activist work, balanced with the going upstream to find out why it's happening in the first place, which is your policy work. Um, and when you find a balance between those two things, I think you can make a real difference. And I've tried. I've tried to stay true to, to the upstream and the downstream and everything I've done since. I love that. And I think when you really see that impact of helping people, doesn't matter how small or big mm -hmm. it is, I think the word progress is the biggest thing, right? Mm -hmm. It's like if you can just take even baby steps to reach your goal. Oh, absolutely. It doesn't have to be leaps and bounds. No, it doesn't. And it's about, and for us, I mean, I think as women, um, and, and we can talk more about this, but I feel like as, as women, um, we are all invested in this shared experience of, of womanhood and, and, you know, with all its joys and all its struggles. And I think as women, we, we tend to find impact in small and big things. You know, it doesn't have to be that 
oh, I've, I've had to impact oh, 100 million lives. It could be something small that you start at home. It could be, start, you know, you could start a kitchen cabinet of your yeah. own and, and make real sort of progress that way. I, I completely agree with that. I think, I think it's a misnomer to always try and focus on the numbers. Um, progress happens very often at home. And uh -huh. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how small it is. Let's talk about your educational background because I know the majority of your life is or was in India. I yeah. know you're now Dubai based, but you studied in the US. Yeah. How did that change the perspective? Did you learn anything about how women were treated differently or did it just kind of open your eyes being in that um, sphere in a US education? You know, for me, well, it did. Um, I, I think the the short and long answer, well, the short and long answer is that it did and it didn't. Um, it did, it, it opened my eyes in the sense that, of course, you know, you, you're going from, if, when, you, when you move from India to anywhere to the West or the US, there's a different way of doing things. You come across aspects of critical thinking, which you'd never really thought about before. So, of course, there's all of that. But I think what I have come to understand um, traveling the world a little bit, working and, and, and learning in different places across the world, is that actually we have more in common than we realize. Mm -hmm. um, especially as women, I think we have more in common than we realize. You know, there is um, there's a concept in, um, in, in Islam called Ummah. I don't know if you're yeah, familiar with that concept, but the, I, from my understanding of it, it denotes the idea of a shared identity, which means that it doesn't matter where you come from, it doesn't matter your, your, your language or your, um, your, your nationhood. The idea is that we share in this common identity. Um, and I think womanhood is something a little bit like that, where we have this, uh, this shared understanding of what it takes to be a woman, which is why, and you see evidence of this everywhere, because which is why when Kamala Harris gets elected to the vice president post in the United States. Women all over the world, people who have never even been to the United US, States, yes. will celebrate. Of course. Right? Because at some level, we've been there. Yes. At some level, we understand what that struggle must have been like. Yeah. And at the same note, you and I could be you know, scrolling through our, um, our Instagram feeds and you may come across the account of a woman who, I don't know, perhaps is stu struggling with uh, body image issues or, or, or finding that balance between work and home. And even though you don't know her, you've never met this, it's a nameless, faceless account, somewhere as a woman, it'll make you stop and maybe even wince a little bit because you understand. Um, well, I so, think women truly have empathy in mm. them, right? They, there is that sense of understanding. And you're right, wherever you are in the world, women are juggling the same thing. It doesn't matter where, which corner of exactly. the world they're in, whether it's exactly. family, blended families, jobs, multitasking, Absolutely. working, and still putting a smile on your face yeah. and still looking and feeling the best you can. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I love that example you gave of the vice president-elect. You know, I think she did make so many women across, the, whether you believe or what party you're in, there was that sense of celebration. And exactly, and for people who clearly don't know her, um, who aren't in the aren't, I mean, we're not Americans, we never yeah. voted, but there was a sense of jubilation and yeah. celebration and joy uh, because you understand that the path to getting there yeah, was paved was. with struggle of and course. difficulty and and I think I, I'm for me I'm a great believer in that I'm a great believer in sort of a rising tide lifting us all um, sort of thing and I think as as um, if, as women if we begin to see each other less as competition but more as collaborators mm -hmm. as co-conspirators yes um, I think we will we will be able to participate like I said in that rising tide that will that will then lift us all well I truly hope this show is a platform for that because mm -hmm. you know we've been doing this for a few seasons and I will say we have an incredible team at Indigo Living not only here but in Hong Kong as well and they watch our show and we wanted to give a platform for women, whether they're small business owners, big business owners, philanthropists, leaders in their community to share their story, their journey. And I truly believe that when this every episode that comes out, mm. that one person's watching and they're like, oh, that's how you do it. Or I've been through that. Or 
you know, how do I make it a reality? Because people just need to be inspired. And Absolutely. I, and I'm so glad actually it's December. I'm glad it's the end of 2020. Yeah. And um, this month is really about celebration. So you said it yourself. Um, the word celebration is coming every week and every episode Thankfully. we have. Thankfully. Thankfully. I think we all need a little bit of that in 2020, don't we? We do. Now let's talk about girl power. First of all, I want to know, when was that moment, that tipping point where you were like, I want to write a book? Yeah. Well, that tipping point has been there for as long as I can remember. Um, I, I think it's, you know, we all have that one dream. Um, you were, and, and I think that's been mine for, for a long time. The, the I have to write a book has been there for a long time. But I have to write this book. Um, came to me when I have two children yeah. um, and my daughter was eight when she started learning and researching about these incredible, captivating, marvelous mm -hmm. women, as she would call them, mommy, they're marvelous women uh, from all over the world. And she found some, she found some incredible stories. So I remember there was a Japanese skateboarder who was inspiring her and an activist in the Congo. She was very taken by Greta Thunberg, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. And it was wonderful. And then she came to me and she said, you know, mom, why aren't there more Indian women who have broken the rules, as she put it, as she very aptly put it. And I can tell you, Rosemann, in that <laughs> moment, and that, and that made that it to the exactly title. That is actually the title. That, so I love exactly, that. that made it to the title. I should have had um, your daughter on the show. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to interview your daughter about this. Um, so she no, came up so with it. So she came up with, well, she came up with why aren't there more Indian women yeah. that we're hearing about. And I can tell you that in that moment, I think I was startled and I was terrified. Um, startled because I realized she was right and we weren't coming across so many Indian stories and terrified that one of my children was growing up without realizing and understanding all the phenom phenomenal women that had come before her to really bring her to where she was today. So um, I took it upon myself and what started was, what started happening was I would research a story during the day and at bedtime I would tell her that story. Now obviously she would ask me questions to which I didn't have the answer so back I was the next day <laughs> researching the question, the answers to those questions and in that very organic way we actually discovered some incredible stories. So there was um, the story of Arunima Sinha, the first, the first female amputee to climb Mount Everest. She did it with one leg amputated and a steel rod in the other. Wow. We discovered the story of um, this incredible female-led um, uh, team of scientists that got the Indian rover to Mars. And it was, it was absolutely marvelous. So uh, all of this to say, never underestimate the power of a startled and terrified mother. <laughs> because she will come up with uh, a solution. So I had to come up with girl power because I realized that this, that these stories needed to go beyond just my daughter. Um, and I wanted to get it to as many little girls as, um, as I possibly could. Well, you're a mom of a little girl and a little boy. Yes. And I think even boys need to know right. that there are incredible role models out there as well. This is an incredible book. You've been to so many book fairs around the world. You have spoken at so many book fairs um, and literary festivals. You are um, an acclaimed columnist. How hard was it to even just edit this book? There are so many incredible stories you had. Um, it was a little bit like walking into this store. It's a little bit like walking into Indigo Living and I'll tell you why because you you walk in and everything is so captivating <laughs> and you sort of want all of it. So when I was when I was researching this book and I was coming across these stories, I wanted to include them all. Yeah, you know because they were actually incredible stories, and they had all the, the elements that stories should have: suspense and mm -hmm. drama and the theatrics. They were incredible. But of course, I could only include fifty. Um, so I tried to I tried to sort of um, include. You know, little girls have have varied dreams. For every little girl who wants to be um, an astronaut, you'll have someone who wants to be an activist. Or for anyone who wants to be a scientist, you'll have someone who wants to be a sportswoman or a singer. And I wanted to have that breadth of, um, of accomplishments in this book. So that's one of the metrics that I use to sort of select 
uh, who is going to be part of this volume was, well, let's try and include um, well, various different as, sectors and exactly, industries, which I was really exactly. impressed about as well. Exactly. And then India's geography. India is geogra geographically very diverse. And I wanted to have some of that diversity also reflected um, in this book, which I think um, it's come out nicely. So I love the color. It is, of course, a superpower. Yes, that's exactly it's what it's right. It's It's exciting. But the illustrations are so lovely as well. What yeah. was that process with finding an illustrator to make these stories come alive? Yeah, it was it was a collaborative, wonderful process. And the way it would work is I would uh, I would do the research, I would write it up, and I would send it to our illustrator, um, who is very camera shy, by the way. Uh, so so, but I would send it to her, and she has in this lovely studio in in Pune, and she would sketch them out. And she's used several different mediums to bring these to life. You've got some watercolor, you've got some charcoal, you've got, uh, you know, I think her talents have been absolutely well on display here and she's done a wonderful job to bring these women um, to life uh, in the pages of this of this book. This book is not only inspiring little girls, it's really helping Indian women but put them on the map and sharing their story. Absolutely and I think that was one of the reasons that I wanted to write about this book is because a lot of these stories, um, especially some of the historical stories, I felt like had been relegated to some dusty page of an old history book um, that was never going to come to light. So the endeavor really was to come together and, and celebrate these stories. You know, um, for me, when I was writing this book, the, the image I had in my mind always was of a great big bonfire uh, or of a great big fireplace, if you will, where all of us as women sort of come together and share our stories and we talk about our, our um, the wars and the wounds but also the victories that we've had and you know we, we, we sing these stories, we tell these stories and we come together to really celebrate that. So this is my contribution to what I think of as that, um, at that, as that great big fireplace that we can all hopefully sit at. Um, as women and um, and enjoy each other and enjoy each other's story. Well, I think everyone needs a copy of this book. It doesn't matter where you come from, from around the world, because they are truly inspiring stories and they're real lessons and um, success stories of, well, as it says here, 50 awesome women. I wasn't <laughs> going to use that word, but um, that they truly are. They really are um, inspiring stories. You're working on the next book. Can you give us a little heads up of what that's about? A little sneak peek? Well, you know, here's the thing. I feel like 2020, um, as we celebrate its end, um, 2020 has really been a year of reckoning for all of us. We've all had to reckon with all sorts of different things. And, um, and one of the things that's happened, and it doesn't matter again where in the world you are, but one of the things that's happened is We've all had to develop almost a new relationship with technology. Right? Yeah. We're learning. To, we're looking. We're learning to to work online. The children are going to school online. They're connecting with their grandparents on FaceTime. We're on our. We're talking to our friends on WhatsApp, and and through all of this, um, I feel like technology has seeped into our lives in a way that it's almost beginning. It's becoming diff difficult to sort of um, to to differentiate. But what's also happened is our generation as parents, we're the first generation that's having to talk to our children about using tech. No generations have to have, have, has had to have this conversation before. And because of that, because we're the first generation doing it, there are no, uh, there are no ancient maps, yeah. if you will, right? There's no guidebooks. Yeah. There's no. There's no conventional wisdom to rely upon. We yeah. all just had to. We've got to figure it. it out. Yeah, we got to figure we it out. We got to figure it out. So um, this this new book is um, is a book that asks some of those questions uh, about how do we have a functional relationship with tech? How do our children have a functional relationship with tech, such that it is um, such that it's done in a way that adds value and is balanced, but it's not insidious, mm -hmm. especially with uh, what's happening with social media, um, teenage depression, and Why all the social media it. is, I mean, I hope you're going to have a chapter at least yeah. on that book because I feel like now kids are learning things that they shouldn't be learning. Mm. They're learning it so quickly. And very early. Very early. Mm. Um, the attention span is so quick. They, yes. they don't even want to sit in a room for more well, than well, yes. 10 minutes. They're so used to strolling. 
Um, and it's happening to all of us. Yeah. Um, uh, it was, um, I was reading a, a piece of research by an MIT professor and he said it very well. He said, you know, what's happening is because we're so used to the pings and the notifications yeah. and the constant interruption and being and, and, and being on Facebook, but also on WhatsApp and replying to an email and checking the news all at the same time. Yeah. Our brains are getting rewired such that we're getting very good at multitasking. Yeah. Great. Mm. But we're also, as he put it, just staying in the shallows. Yeah. We're not able to do anything in depth. 100%. I need to read that article <laughs> from MIT. Send that over. No, I completely agree with that. It's, you know, the way everyone is communicating is so different. Mm. Um, and to really also just have these relationships that are have depth in them rather than these surface relationships because mm. everyone is just WhatsApping, there's no conversation. And now with this year, we've had minimal contact with people as well. And I think it's affected all generations, whether it's seniors, um, middle age and even you know younger children it's actually affected how everyone has communicated absolutely and you know I think what you were alluding to was it, it was it, real intimacy with with others which is something we need to think about and also um, intimacy with ourselves yeah because what's happening is when you grow up um, on social media as a lot of young people are nowadays you tend to measure your self-esteem by the number of likes you get on a yeah. post and that's a very difficult way to live. Look, I think the teenage years are hard enough, no matter what. Yeah. But when you begin to add on these pressures um, to a young mind that isn't even fully developed yet, I think um, I think there, there's a reckoning. So, um, so that's what that's what this research is focused on. The next, well, the next piece of research is focused book. on in the next book which will be released in 2021. So I'm very excited about it. Well, I'm so excited. We have something to look forward to next year. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank I'm you. so happy to have what a you. This is her book. It's called Girl Power. It is available on Amazon. Uh, make sure you add to Basket because it is definitely um, a book that I think everyone, whether you're a girl or a boy, should be reading. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Roseman. What a pleasure. And thank you for joining us in our last month of 2020. Make sure you follow us on YouTube, of course, Instagram, and um, send in your comments, like, follow, do all of that. And of course, visit us here at Indigo Living. Thanks for joining us, everyone.